Good evening. I'm Stuart Brand from the Long Now Foundation. And um, I'm dressed for time travel. <laughs> Anybody else here dressed for time travel tonight? <laughs> Just in case it works. <laughs> I want to go back to 1984 and whisper in my ear that doing something called the Holer Software Catalog is not going to be a good idea. Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> and it got a great big advance. And in Britain, at the time, here was this. This is 84. And software at that time in Britain was a cartridge of tape that you hooked. In. Here was 8-inch floppies. There was this cartridge of tape, so here's a book telling all these amazing things that you could get that they couldn't get. And uh, they sent me around to the television shows, and it was Christmas time, so they wanted to do an ugly Christmas sweater, and they made this for me. <laughs> I probably had faded jeans. And um, it was a disaster, top to bottom. <clears throat> if I could go back and undo that, I would undo that. Time doesn't work that way, but we keep wanting it to. And the Long Now Foundation, in a way, is one kind of work around. Well, if it's trouble to deal with the past because we can't change it, trouble to deal with the future because you can't really see what's coming, just to expand the now 10,000 years in each direction, it's not a problem anymore, right? Um, it's sort of working. But the way humans wrestle with the asymmetry of time is one of the most <clears throat> interesting things we do. In every period of time, of every period of civilization figures different ways to, to deal with the problem. And this is where you want to have an historian of science, an historian of the effects of science on culture, to help think about all that. And nobody is better at that then our speaker, James Click. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you, people of the, people of the long now, for having me here. Um, I'm not sure I'm dressed for time travel. <laughs> we can turn that off now. I, I want to I begin by asking you to cast your mind backward in time, which, which I know you can do. It's one of your superpowers. Let's say it's the 1890s. Put yourselves in the shoes of a young man trying to write a book for the first time. And here's the man. Now, you've seen other pictures of this man, but probably never without a mustache. He was named Herbert, Bertie to his family, but he preferred to be known by his initials, H.G., because that seemed more dignified. Here he is at the Normal School in London, which later became the Royal College of Science. And as you might guess from the picture, he's studying biology, where the hot new thing in the history of life is, <coughs> is um, Charles Darwin. And he's also fascinated by the new geology, as revealed by Charles Lyell. These two Charleses, not by coincidence, are giving humanity a new view of the eons of time stretching out behind them. Anyway, you are a very young H.G. Wells, planning your, planning your future mustache. <laughs> and you have an idea for a fantastic tale that takes place far in the future. You think of yourself as a futurist, though that's barely even a word. Most ordinary people never even think about the future. Or if they do, they regard it, and I'm quoting H.G. now, as a sort of blank non-existence upon which the advancing present will presently write events. You, however, are more creative. You're forward-looking. Now, just in terms of storytelling technique, Wells had a technical problem. Nowadays, a, might, a writer might just tell the reader, it's the year of our Lord, 802,701, 
and get on with the story, but you couldn't do that in the 19th century. It was too weird. People couldn't wrap their minds around it. And by the way, right around the same time, in 1889, Mark Twain had a similar problem. He needed to transport a modern-day Connecticut Yankee back to the time of King Arthur's court. So he does it by beginning his tale with a prologue titled, A Word of Explanation. In this prologue, a curious stranger strikes up a conversation with the narrator and says, you know about transmigration of souls. Do you know about transposition of epochs and bodies? This is what we would call nowadays mumbo jumbo. <laughs> but Mark Twain couldn't use the word time travel because there was no such word. There was no such concept. In case you don't remember how the transposition of epochs occurs in Connecticut Yankee, the Yankee gets hit on the head by a crowbar, out cold. When he wakes up, he's in a green field, looking up at a knight in shining armor, and now ensues my favorite two-word bit of dialogue in the whole time travel literature. The Connecticut Yankee points to the horizon and says, Bridgeport? <coughs> Camelot, says the knight. Later, when the story ends, Mark Twain chickens out, and he tells us the whole thing was just a dream. So he missed his opportunity. How did Wells solve his narrative problem? Well, you already know. He invented a time machine. It's famous. So can you visualize the time machine? I'll give you a second. Close your eyes if it helps. Maybe you were picturing this. A plush red chair, great spinning disc, colored light bulbs. But this is not H.G. Wells' time machine. When you consult the book, you discover that Wells hardly describes the machine at all. There's some fast verbal hocus pocus and an impression of shiny nickel and ivory and brass rails and some screws to be loosened with oil and a lever and a saddle to sit on. Actually, the time machine is a fantasticated bicycle, which makes sense. Wells was a proud bicyclist, and he'd never seen a motor car, of course, and so if the funny Baroque sled overwrote the original in your brain, it's probably because you saw the 1960 Hollywood version directed by George Powell. So this is Rod Taylor at the controls. In the book, he's called only the time traveler, for so it will be convenient to speak of him. But in the movie, he has to have a name, so he's called George. He turns the lever, and he hurdles into the future where he meets a futuristic person called Weena. In the book, Weena is a tiny creature. <coughs> Here she turns out to be Yvette Mimieux. Later, Yvette married my cousin Stanley, but, but that's, that's true. But that's, <coughs> but that's another story. Now, you can see that George and Weena are getting to know each other. Weena is strangely ignorant of history. George says, don't your people ever speak of the past? There is no past, she says. Do they wonder about the future? There is no future. She lives in the now, it seems. And H.G. Wells thought most of his contemporaries did too. They lived in the now. Here we are the 21st century, the people of Wells' distant future, and we are time travel experts. We are aficionados. Time travel is everywhere. It's in pop songs, TV commercials. It's in the wallpaper. We've got time machines, time gates, doorways, windows, not to mention time ships and special closets, DeLoreans, <laughs> police boxes, 
Animated cartoons have been doing time travel since 1925. In Felix the Cat Trifles with Time, Father Time agrees to send the unhappy Felix back to a faraway time inhabited by cavemen and dinosaurs. In a, in a 1944 Looney Tunes episode, Elmer Fudd dreams his way into the future. When you hear the sound of the gong, it will be exactly 2000 AD, where a newspaper headline reveals, smell -a vision replaces television. <laughs> then, by 1960, Rocky and his friends were sending the dog Mr. Peabody and his pet boy Sherman through the Wayback Machine to straighten out William Tell, Calamity Jane. The next year, Donald Duck made his first trip into prehistory to invent the wheel. Homer Simpson, you may remember, found an unusual device to use as a time machine. Right, <laughs> a toaster. And there's Peabody and Sherman floating by. Uh, apparently, time travel is so crowded by this time, it needs air traffic control. <laughs> About five years ago, China's State Administration of Radio, Film, and Television officially denounced time travel, warning that these stories interfere with history. I'm quoting, casually make up myths, have monstrous and weird plots, use absurd tactics, and even promote feudalism, superstition, fatalism, and reincarnation. And they're right, in a way. Time travel is subversive. It's not just in popular culture, either. Physicists love to specula speculate about time travel. Neuroscientists, psychologists, have created a whole field of study called mental time travel or on formal days, chronesthesia. <laughs> Philosophers, when they talk about the metaphysics of change and causality, can't help but start talking about time travel and its paradoxes. So it's strange to realize that the concept is barely more than a century old. It seemed strange enough to me to be worth a book. Time travel feels like an ancient tradition rooted in old mythologies like gods and dragons, but, but it isn't. The ancients imagined immortality and rebirth and reincarnation and lands of the dead, but the idea of getting into a machine or walking through a magic portal or even getting whacked on the head in order to travel to the future or the past this was beyond their ken. So the obvious question was why. Why did it take so long to invent time travel? And then why did it happen when it did? Well, a lot of things were happening all at once. At, at the close of the 19th century, there was huge curiosity and excitement about the wonders of progress. People had seen in their lifetimes the coming of railroads, the telegraph, all the wonders of electricity. In France, a product of this was Jules Verne and his technological fantasies, although he never actually did time travel. Then, when the turn of the century arrived, the rollover of the calendar date brought all kinds of speculation about the turn of the next century, the year 2000, a great round number. So people imagined flying cars and space travel and underwater golf, and lots of other wonderful stuff, some of which we actually have. Let me just show you this one picture by way of example. This is, this is one of a set of prints made to imagine life in the year 2000 by a French artist named Jean-Marc Coté for cigarette cards. You can see it's a schoolroom, and printed books are being fed through a sort of grinder and converted into a form that can be transmitted into the boys' heads through wires. So this is a vision that you have to admit has come true, at least, 
you know, in a certain way. <laughs> On the other hand, we also have an advance that most futurists were not able to imagine, which is um, girls in the classroom. <laughs> so here's the thing. Technology advances. It changes the fabric of our world. It changes the way we live. And these changes come rapidly. And this is so normal and so self-evident that we tend to forget it wasn't always like that. But of course, it wasn't. Suppose you got in your time machine and headed back to the past and dropped in on some random stranger, let's say the year 1500, and you asked, what do you suppose life will be like for your grandchildren? Well, they'd think you were crazy. The question wouldn't make sense. Life for their grandchildren was going to be the same as life for them. Their life was the same as life for their grandparents. Shakespeare scholars sometimes point out there are a bunch of anachronistic mistakes in his plays. In, uh, in Julius Caesar, a clock strikes the hour of three when actually there were no mechanical clocks in ancient Rome or for the next thousand years. So, silly mistake, right? But how could Shakespeare have known that? He had no conception that technological progress has a history. For him, the word anachronism literally didn't exist. Then came that thing that we call the Industrial Revolution and steam engines and bicycles and telegraphs and electric lights. And by the end of the 19th century, people weren't just aware of changing technology, they were getting obsessed. If you remember Connecticut Yankee, that's actually the point of the book. The whole thing is a riff on the magic of technological change. The wizard of King Arthur's court, Merlin, is an old fraud. The real wizard is our Yankee because he knows about lightning rods and gunpowder. And Mark Twain, as you may know, was a total enthusiast. He was the first on his block with a telephone. He was the first famous writer ever to use a typewriter. He would absolutely have loved the whole Earth catalog. <laughs> a funny thing about the time machine, though, is that it's not interested in technology at all, at least apart from the machine in the title. The future isn't technologically advanced. On the contrary, it's degenerate. Not only don't they have electricity, they've forgotten about fire. Luckily, the time traveler brought some matches. The book was a huge bestseller on both sides of the Atlantic, and it made Wells famous. It was in the category of fantastic yarn. People thought of Edgar Allan Poe. And if you read it now, the time machine feels very old-fashioned. And then you realize that the reason is it's because time travel doesn't yet exist, and so before the story can get started, the whole concept has to be explained very pedantically. The time traveler gathers all his friends in the drawing room, and he pontificates. He says, you must follow me carefully. I shall have to controvert one or two ideas that are almost universally accepted. The geometry, for instance, that they taught you at school is founded on a misconception. Remember how you all learned, he's, he's, he tells them, there are three dimensions, length, width, and height. Well, guess what? There's a fourth dimension, too, and the fourth dimension is time. The time traveler explains, through a natural infirmity of the flesh, we incline to overlook this fact, but there is no difference between time and any of the three dimensions of space except that our consciousness moves along it. So, presumably you're thinking, well, duh, of course time is the fourth dimension. But in 1895, that would not have been the normal reaction. And it's not the reaction of the time traveler's friends in the drawing room. They say it's ridiculous. The thing's a mere paradox, says one. It's against reason, says another. And the reviewer said more or less the same thing. 
The New York Times said, worth reading if you like to read impossible yarns, which is a blurb I'd sort of like to have on one of my books. <laughs> and, and most reviewers appreciated the fantasy, but the serious critic for the Pell-Mell magazine wagged a stern finger. There is no getting into the future except by waiting. You can only sit down and see it come by. In verity, there is no time traveler, Mr. Wells, save old father time himself. Instead of being a fourth dimension of space, time is perpetually traveling through space. Remember, it's 1895. So 10 years later, Albert Einstein came along and basically made the fourth dimension official. He explains time pretty much the way Wells' time traveler did. The difference between Einstein and Wells being that Wells was just kidding. <laughs> <coughs> he thought he was just making up mumbo-jumbo, waving, hand-waving to help his story along. And for the rest of his life, he was a great disappointment to many time travel fans who wanted more from him. In his old age, he tried to remember how this idea came to him. He said, in the universe in which my brain was living in 1879, there was no nonsense about time being space or anything of that sort. There were three dimensions, up and down, fore and aft, and right and left. And I never heard of a fourth dimension until 1884 or thereabout. And then I thought it was a witticism. Now, I'm not saying that we need to trust Wells in his post facto introspection, there was clearly something in the air, something, something that everyone was breathing, including Wells and Einstein. And anyway, Wells opened the floodgates. He started something. And the many streams and rivers of time travel begin at this point with the time machine. And then later came the pulp magazines that sprung up in New York in the first decades of the new century, amazing stories and wonder stories, and there are many heirs and successors. Many of them are alive to this day. And meanwhile, off somewhere else, a great modernist literature was being born, which we don't think of as time travel, but which shows a growing fascination and awareness that time could be very, very weird. I'm talking about Proust and Joyce, and Virginia Woolf, they are all about time. Time is their subject, and, and time is being manipulated in their work in new ways. Proust wrote, near the end of his great work, the fact that we occupy an ever larger place in time, capital T, is something that everybody feels. A larger place in time. We occupy that larger place. We embody time. We take the past and the future on board. It's an odd thing to say that everybody feels that, but it's true today, isn't it? So let me ask you all a basic question. I can barely see you, but I'm, I'm going to ask for hands anyway. Let's say you are awarded the use of a time machine, good for one voyage safe return guaranteed, it's a return trip. Do you go to the future or the past? Future? Past? I think it, it looked like there was a little more future in this crowd, <laughs> which is a, a little unusual. Um, here's, an answer from, here's an answer from Twitter via Joyce Carol, this is from Joyce Carol Oates. <laughs> look, look how many time travel tropes she's managed to squeeze into 140 characters. I, she didn't get the grandfather. Um, when I started working on my book, I have to admit, I assumed that most people would automatically choose the future. And I, I assumed that I would go to the future. And Wells himself interested though he was in the history of the world, never bothered sending his time traveler back 
to check out the dinosaurs or interview Shakespeare. He was a future guy all the way. But of course, my assumption was completely naive. And, and nowadays, especially, the future is not as, well, it's not as shiny and appealing as it once seemed. It didn't take long, when you look at the history of the time travel literature, for other writers to see the possibilities of hurtling backward in time. And I don't mean getting bonked on the head and wake, waking up in Camelot. I'm Camelot. I mean traveling freely to times of your choosing. One of the first writers to explore retrograde time travel was in the first years of the 20th century, a younger friend of Wells named E. Nesbitt, E for Edith. She was a fellow forward-looking, free-thinking socialist. In her book, The Story of the Amulet, she sends a pack of child heroes back to ancient Egypt and to Babylon and to Atlantis, not necessarily all real pl places. In, in Atlantis, people are riding around on hairy mammoths and so on. In this cover drawing, you can see them checking out the mummy at the British Museum which was London's very own time portal. Without intending to, Nesbitt was inventing a time travel subgenre. We can see it later includes classics like Sherman and Peabody, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. <laughs> it's fair to say that the history in this genre isn't always reliable. My own favorite Peabody and Sherman episode is the one where they meet Isaac Newton. And Peabody solemnly explains that Sir Isaac had a brother named Figby who invented a cookie. <laughs> so comically or not, time travel lets us have at least the illusion of exploring a past that was once alive and is now lost. These stories let us feel that the past is still there, waiting for us to come find it. We get to exercise muscles that we use whenever we, whenever we look at old photographs, when we go to museums, when we collect antiques, when we investigate history. I was struck by a remark of the great German writer, Zebalt. Might it not be that we also have appointments to keep in the past, in what has gone before and is for the most part extinguished and must go there in search of places and people who have some connection with us on the far side of time, so to speak. That's the impulse at work here. The, the past pulls at us. We have appointments there. But it's just a beginning because as soon as people started imagining actual time travel into the past, they came face to face with inescapable problems, the famous paradoxes. Even Edith Nesbitt's children saw this. At one point they meet Julius Caesar at his tent in Gaul, looking hungrily across the English Channel for a new country to conquer. And they try to talk him out of it. Oh, please, sir, don't conquer Britain. It's a poor little place, hardly worth your trouble. But this backfires. They end up talking him into it, because after all, that really happened. And you can't change history. This is a rule. And of course, all rules are made to be broken. And before long, we're all going back, and we're killing Hitler. Or worse, meeting ourselves selves, plural, because multiplying selves is one of the things time travel does, along with revising histories and bifurcating universes. Here's, a time, here's an example of a time, travel, time traveler meeting themselves. <laughs> On the right, I'm sure many of you recognize Joseph Gordon-Levitt. He is Joe. This is the 2012 movie Looper by Ryan, John Ryan Johnson. Joe is a, a sort of time-traveling hitman. And, and on the left, Bruce Willis is also Joe, 
only older and wiser. So they're meeting for the first time. Young Joe has a few questions, as you can imagine. And old Joe says, I don't want to talk about time travel shit, because if we start talking about it, then we're going to be here all day talking about it and making diagrams with straws. <laughs> so the internet being the internet, it took no time at all for people to make diagrams with straws <laughs> <laughs> meant to explain the movie's very twisty plot, and that's an example, but I'm not going to leave it up there long enough for you to try to figure it out. We'll be here all day. But here's another diagram in the same family. This diagram was drawn with a pencil by Robert Heinlein in 1940 or 41 to help, him, help himself keep track of a story he was writing. Sorry, the title in his mind was Bob's Busy Day, which is a great title. But when the story was published by Astounding Science Fiction magazine, they titled it By His Bootstraps. And I love this story. I loved it when I was a kid, and I loved it all over again when I reread it to work on this book. Um, part of what's wonderful about it is that you can see that it's still early days for time travel. Fifty years have gone by since the time machine, and pulp fiction writers like Bob Heinlein pounding their typewriters for peanuts trying to figure out the rules, the rules of the game. And you can watch their creative minds at work. By the way, Heinlein got paid $70 for this story. It opens with a man named Bob sitting in his room, typing his philosophy dissertation, which is apparently about the metaphysics of time travel. And behind him, he suddenly hears a voice saying, don't bother with it, it's all hogwash. And he turns around to see a chap about the same size as himself and much the same age, maybe just a tiny bit older, with what looks like a three-day growth of beard and a black eye. And the chap has apparently emerged from a hole hanging in the air. And he opens a cupboard and helps himself to Bob's gin. And he says, just call me Joe. Well, we, 21st century people, are savvy about this stuff, and we see right away what's going on. But Bob is slow to catch on. Joe tells him the hole in the air is a time gate. He wants Bob to walk through it into the future. As they discuss it, a third man materializes, and he bears a sort of family resemblance to Bob and Joe. And he emphatically does not want Bob to listen to Joe. And then the phone rings, and it's a fourth man checking on everyone's progress. <laughs> and hilarity ensues. We know that all the men are the same, but not everyone is in on the joke, or rather, they are let in at different times. It's a, it becomes a farce, doors slamming, and a confused and angry girlfriend, and a hat that keeps getting lost and found and lost again. <coughs> and meanwhile, Bob Heinlein, who may think he's just a hack writer without a lot of pretensions, is actually quite serious and can't help but following where the story leads, which is into some deep philosophical thickets. Is there one self? or are there many? Does the self have continuity, or is it created anew at every instant? This is a problem for us back here in the real world, where we remember our younger selves, who both are and are not the person we've become. And even without time travel, we manage to create alter egos and split personalities. And each of the bobs in this story had felt themselves to be the one and only integrated, continuous being named Bob, but they're forced to confront the possibility that this is an illusion, that they're just making it up as they go along, that the self is a story they're telling themselves. 
And this isn't the only problem. Heinlein also finds himself confronting the issue of free will and determinism. He can't help it, you might say. As soon as any of the Bobs go back to an earlier day and relive an episode they've already been through, they're bound to ask, can't I do it differently this time? When Bob 1 is talking to Bob 2, déjà vu is inevitable. He feels he's reciting a script. He's on a treadmill and he can't get off, and he doesn't like it. He tries to argue with himself. This is impossible, Bob says to Bob. You're telling me that I did something because I was going to do something. And Bob replies, well, didn't you? You were there. Well, we're not going to solve this problem in one story, and also we're not going to solve it tonight. But time travel is heavily implicated. I'm going to say it's a tool we're using collectively as a culture in an investigation of free will and faith and the nature of the self, the paradoxes of memory. We're still trying to learn what time is, which, by the way, I intend to explain in a minute. <laughs> but first, here's one last time traveler meeting himself. This is H.G. Wells again, the older meeting the younger. This is a, a 1924 caricature by Max Beerbohm, and I, I'll, I'll read you the handwritten caption. Don't strain your eyes. It goes, the young self says, did you ever manage to articulate the bones of the micro fed lizard? And the old self says, I'm not sure, but I've articulated the whole past of mankind on this planet and the whole future, too. I don't think you know very much about the past, do you? It's all perfectly beastly, believe me. But the future is going to be perfectly splendid after a bit. All right, so <clears throat> what is time? Well, everyone knows what time is. Also, no one knows what time is. And this paradox was noticed by Augustine in the fourth century, and people have been quoting him ever since, wittingly and unwittingly. Augustine wrote, what then is time? He wrote this in Latin. If no one asks me, I know. If I wish to explain it to one that asks, I know not. Isaac Newton said at the outset of the Principia that everyone knew what time was, but then he proceeded to rewrite what everyone knew. A modern physicist, Sean Carroll, says, everyone knows what time is. It's what you find out by looking at a clock. He also says, time is the label we stick on different moments in the life of the world. Now, physicists are the specialists we tend to think should have the official answer. And they keep reverting to these bumper sticker definitions. Richard Feynman said, time is what happens when nothing else happens. <laughs> Which is sort of a wisecrack. <laughs> or is it? And John Archibald Wheeler is supposed to have said, Time is nature's way to keep everything from happening all at once. <laughs> but Woody Allen said that, too. And Wheeler admitted having found it scrawled in a Texas men's room. <clears throat> and then Susan Sontag did the boys one better. Time exists in order that everything doesn't happen all at once, and space exists so that it doesn't all happen to you. <laughs> When Augustine contemplated time, one thing he knew was that it was not space. And yet, Lord, we perceive intervals of times and compare them and say some are shorter and others longer. We measure time, he said, though he had no clocks. We measure times as they are passing by perceiving them, but past which now are not, or the future which are not yet, who can measure? You cannot measure what does not yet exist, Augustine felt, nor what has passed away. Nowadays, of course, we do measure time. 
we spend so much time measuring time that we hardly have time for anything else. Augustine would be surprised. Anyway, we keep asking what time is as if the right combination of words could crack the lock and let in the light. We want a fortune cookie definition, a perfect epigram. Daniel Borston says, time is the landscape of experience. Nabokov says, time is but memory in the making. Martin Heidegger says, there is no time. Sometimes we say time is a river. It flows. You can't step into the same one twice. If time is a river, are we standing on the bank watching it go by, or are we bobbing along? In an episode of the original Star Trek, Spock explains that there could be some logic to the belief that time is fluid, like a river, with currents, eddies, backwash. Of course, time is not a river, nor is it a road, an arrow, or a maze, or a tide, or a thread, or a ladder. These are metaphors. Nabokov also said, time is a fluid medium for the culture of metaphors. <laughs> <coughs> Newton said authoritatively that time flows, but that too is just a metaphor, and he was just as likely to represent time as a quantity. If time is a quantity, we can store it up, apparently. We save it, we spend it, we accumulate it and bank it, and we do all this quite obsessively nowadays. But the notion is at least 400 years old. Francis Bacon, 1612, to choose time is to save time. Unfortunately, the corollary of saving time is wasting it. We go back and forth between being time's master and its victim. Time is ours to use, and then we are at its mercy. Richard II says, I wasted time, and now doth time waste me. For now hath time made me his numbering clock. So if you say that an activity wastes time, implying a substance in finite supply, and then you say that the same activity fills time, implying a sort of container, are you contradicting yourself? Are you confused? Are you committing a failure of logic? Well, none of those, I think. On the contrary, we are clever creatures when it comes to time. And we can keep more than one idea in our heads. And we know that language is imperfect. We know metaphors are fluid. We can occupy the time and pass the time in the same breath. We can devour time or languish in its slow-chapped power. Lately, it's become fashionable among physicists to ask whether time is even real. I'll do air quotes, whether it exists. The question is debated at conferences and symposia and analyzed in books. But when a physicist says time isn't real, it's not the same as saying unicorns aren't real. You don't see physicists throwing away their wristwatches. It's a sort of code. Saying time isn't real is a way of saying that our perception of time is all wrong. It's a way of saying past and future are the same, mathematically speaking. Which, remember, is just what the time traveler tells his friends in the drawing room and what Einstein began to explain a decade later. A few weeks before he died, Einstein put it this way, in a letter to a friend. People like us who believe in physics know that the distinction between past, present, and future is only a stubbornly persistent illusion. But it is stubbornly persistent. Time is an er ineradicable part of the human experience. We remember the past. We await the future. The physicist notes that we are fallible creatures, easily fooled, not to be trusted. Our pre-scientific ancestors experienced the flat earth and the traveling sun. Could our experience of time be that naive? 
I don't think so. I don't even think Einstein believed that. It would be perverse, in a way, for a scientist to believe that the future is already complete, locked down tight, no different from the past. The whole motivation for the scientific enterprise, the, the prime directive, is to gain some control over the future that we're otherwise tumbling into blind. For me, it comes down to this. The universe does what it does. We perceive change, perceive motion, and try to make sense of a teeming, blooming confusion. Augustine was right all along. The modern philosopher J.R. Lucas, in his treatise on time and space, comes back around. We cannot say what time is because we know already, and our saying could never match up to all that we already know. So when we take stock, when we set aside the search for the perfect epigram or for the perfect definition, it turns out that we do know a great deal. We know that the past is gone. It's finished, done and dusted, signed, sealed, and delivered. It recedes from us in the rearview mirror. Our access to it is compromised. We've got fading memories and crumbling fossils. We can argue about what happened. We know that eyewitnesses are unreliable and records can be tampered with. The unrecorded past for us no longer exists. And the future is different. The future is yet to come. It's open. Not everything can happen, but many things can. The world is still under construction. What is time? Things change, and time is how we keep track. Stephen Hawking likes to speculate about time travel, as many physicists do. He likes to offer reasons it might be possible, and then on other days, he likes to prove that it's impossible. Once, he famously sent out invitations for a party to be held in the past. <laughs> of course, nobody came. <laughs> Ergo, Hawking said, time travel is impossible. Well, it doesn't matter. We time travel in our brains, and that's not nothing. Our culture, in the broadest sense of that, world, of that word, our species-wide distributed information storage and transmission system is a time machine. We are all time travelers now, like it or not. We are time lords. The English novelist Ali Smith says, we're well past the end of the century when time for the first time curved, bent, slipped, flash forwarded and flash backed, yet still keeps rolling along. We know it all now with our thoughts traveling at the speed of tweet, our 140 characters in search of a paragraph. We're post history, we're post mystery. So why do we need time travel when we already travel through space so far and so fast? We need it for history, for mystery, for nostalgia, for hope, to examine our potential, to explore our memories, to counter regret for the life we lived, the one life, one dimension beginning to end. We need time travel because time is a bastard. Time is coming for us. Time is a jailer and an executioner. And our glorious future, the Jetsons' future, the limitless future, the future imagined in Cote's cigarette cards, flying cars, the future of the futurists, where did that go? Well, it's been foreshortened. One of William Gibson's science fictionish characters said 15 years ago, fully imagined futures were the luxury of another day, one in which now was of some greater duration. We have no future because our present is too volatile. The future stands upon the present, and the present is quicksand, 
And surely that's the point of this organization, the Long Now Foundation, to recover the future before it slips away. We're coping with nostalgia for a vanishing future. We need preservationists for the future. And if that isn't a time travel paradox, I don't know what is. <laughs> Virginia Woolf said that the past shelters us on one side and the future on the other side. We need them both. Our entry into the past and the future, fleeting and imperfect as it may be, is what keeps us human. Thank you. A question from live stream. Um, did <coughs> Einstein ever meet Wells, and did Wells have any influence on Einstein? Were they aware of each other at all? Oh, I so badly wanted that to be true. Uh, and I, spent, I did spend some time mm -hmm. thinking about it and hoping I could find some scrap of some shred of mm -hmm. evidence. Einstein, you know, is pretty well documented, and, I, and we would know if he had. And also, uh, was, it was a while before the time machine was translated into German. So, so I'm going to say no. It, it didn't work that way. But, but it, I, you know, I said they were breathing the same air. Mm -hmm. They really were in this world where Einstein was being influenced by the existence of electric clocks at railway stations uh -huh. by, by a recognition of simultaneity that was created by the electric telegraph. So it, it didn't have to happen. And as I said, Wells um, never believed in it himself. And uh, when Einstein was doing relativity, uh, he came up with this sort of the, 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 the train travel metaphor for yeah, how it Yeah, he used worked. trains. And in the absence of trains, that might not have actually been no. a way for him to think about it. No, that's right. And he needed the, the idea of trains going, going past you at high mm -hmm. velocity. That, mm -hmm. was, that was also an influence on Wells. Mm -hmm. I mean, Wells was living in, in um, Victorian England, and, and you could ride a train and look out the window and see a farmer with an a plow behind an oxen that was a scene that, that existed 400 years earlier and you're going zipping past on a, on a, with a steam engine and you can mm -hmm. see telegraph wires mm -hmm. across the landscape and you, have, you experience a kind of temporal dissonance that was, okay. that was new, an analog of cognitive dissonance. Uh -huh. And, and I, I think that's something that, that had to have affected both Wells and Einstein and all the rest of them. I mean, this is really the point, yeah. not just these two guys, but that the whole culture was very excitedly and very animatedly thinking about time and getting confused by it. Why was the turn of that century, 19th to 20th, um, all about the splendid, shiny, progressed future and the turn of the 20th century into the 21st was a lot darker. What's yeah. your sense of what happened? Well, that's, that's a, a huge question, isn't it? Uh, I mean, why didn't we have, because we really didn't have, I mean, occasionally uh, there were a few newspapers that thought, okay, we'll ask some profound thinkers. Maybe they asked you, Stuart, what, did you, what do you expect for sure, the year 20, yeah. 2100? Yeah. Um, but the answers were sort of disappointing. Mm -hmm. And if you try to answer that question in your own minds now, I, you know, what have you got? What have you got that either we don't have or you don't think is going to turn up in the next couple of years anyway? Well, you might be thinking about cyborg sorts of things. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of AI stuff going on. Yeah. And a lot of dystopia. A, a lot, lot of, of dystopia. Now, of course, that's, and that's part of the story, too, is that along the way, mm -hmm. not only did we get flying cars, but we got the atom bomb. We discovered that technology could do the most horrible things. And yet, 
uh, by the late 60s on into the 70s, we're getting space travel, we're going to the moon, we're getting the image of the Earth from space, which kind of replaced the mushroom cloud as the way to think about the big things going on. And all of that was kind of hopeful and out there, and Heinlein was totally into it. This is, you know, humanity's bar mitzvah we're going forward. And yet, uh, by the year 2000, it was, uh, oh my God, we're all going to die because of the white UK bug. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and space travel seems to have fizzled a little bit. I'm human space travel, and I'm not sure, I'm not sure why that is. I mean, well, there's a good biological answer to that, which is robots are happy in space and, and uh, flesh isn't. I'm, are you sure that robots are happy, Stuart? <laughs> The artists I hung out with <coughs> in the 60s, a group called USCO, our theory was that, uh, we referred to it then, is radios were uh, encouraging humans to basically develop radios so that they could live in space because that's where they were trying to get to all this time. And once they got there, they would throw us away. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's also true. In all the science fiction I was reading when I was a kid, all the space, tra mm. much more space travel than time travel, mm. people kept dying all the time. I mean, things went wrong. There mm. were things exploded. It was space travel was dangerous. And then in our real world, when people started dying, we really we didn't like it. I, I'm not I'm not making a joke about this. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I mean, it's point. we have a we don't have a high tolerance as a society for an activity that is going to, you know, kill half of the people who participate in it, even if the individuals themselves might be volunteers. I'm, I'm, I don't have a, an opinion. I'm not making a judgment about that, whether that's good or bad. Well, it, it may be part of the sort of <clears throat> state of the sense that, well, shouldn't death be optional like everything else? Yeah. These days, which was not how people thought about things like that 100 years ago where it was taken as a given. So related to that, both Kevin Kelly and Andy Lee asked versions of uh, Kevin S. what's new with time travel metaphors these days. Andy Lee asked what are our present predictions for time travel. You've sort of tracked the, the track of time travel over a century plus. What's the current state, the right. current trend, where are we seem to well, be Well, that's going? a very good question, and it's a question I, I worried about while I was working on the book, partly because I wondered how I was going to end the book. <laughs> Did you know when you started? No. Ah. And part, well, I, I had an idea. I just had a glimmering of a, I had a question, let's put it that way. <laughs> the question I had was, is something new happening to our sense of time in our mm -hmm. hyperspeed, hyperconnected mm -hmm. world? And, and the answer to that is clearly yes. And so then it, the question was, you know, well, what? It, what is it that's happening? And luckily for me, I didn't have to figure out the answer myself because people kept on, you know, artists, mm -hmm. creative artists, keep on exploring the territory. And as I was, as I spent four or five years writing the book, new stuff came out. And people were, artists continue to, well, I should say artists continue to do the same old thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you turn on the TV this year, you can see a bunch of new time travel stories that are, very, that are mostly, as far as I can tell, pretty old-fashioned. Mm -hmm. But some people are doing really new things, and you can see that these writers, I'm thinking of William Gibson again, um, many others who you, who you can name, they're living in this hyper-connected world, and they are trying to imagine new forms of time travel. Time travel in which what's transmitted into the future or the past is not a, a bodily person, but only information. Mm -hmm. Let's say that's the rule, the rule of the game. Um, and that's a way of commenting on an experience that we're having in our modern world, where we are, reality is coming to us all the time on multiple screens. Mm -hmm. We're getting messages from the device in our pocket or the phone is ringing or we're seeing something on TV and we don't know which comes first and which is a representation of the past or which is, is happening in what we laughingly call real time. And it's complicated to be a citizen of this era trying to cope with time. And, and if we sometimes 
feel ourselves to be time travelers. I think that's, well, that's natural. It sounds like a kind of a smearing of the present <laughs> is going on. Yeah. You, you talk about the, the net as being the, this time machine in its own right, where you can you know, just fling together in seconds uh, a whole range of things from different periods of time, different places which feel like different times, and so on. Which raises a question that Kevin raises, is does time travel exhibit a similar sequence in other cultures, like in the East, China, India, Japan, and so on? Because um, you're telling kind of a, a European it's a very It's a very Eurocentric story, Anglo-centric story, not the story that I've told. And I really um, made an effort to find out. Mm -hmm. And I think that, the, that the, the, the real answer, and I keep waiting to be contradicted mm -hmm. by someone who knows better, but I think the correct answer to that is that th this literal phenomenon of time, if you, if you talk about time travel as this literal genre where um, hmm. you have an ability to willfully travel to a point in time in the past or the future, mm -hmm. time travel narrowly defined, that really is a, a, a Western idea. And um, it's been slow to spread to... You mentioned one culture where the, the question of whether uh, where you're facing is the future or where yes. you're facing is the past. And tell me about the one that faces the past. Yeah, that's an, this is an interesting and related question. Besides mm -hmm. the question of time tra literal time travel literature mm -hmm. in other cultures, the way we think about time is very cultural, culturally dependent and language dependent. Mm -hmm. And we, um, we Westerners, if I ask everybody in the room to point to the future, I'm pretty sure you don't have to do it, but I think most people do this. Mm -hmm. And you think the past is back there. And so you think naturally that's, we're culturally bound. We think that that's necessary and obvious, but it's not obvious. And there are cultures that point in the opposite direction that say, there's the future, there's the past. Mm -hmm. And then you have to f try to figure out, well, what's the logic in that? Well, okay, you're a science historian, historian. You're one of those guys who's just facing the past all the time, right? Sort of backing into well, the future. Well, uh, you can see the past is visible to us. Mm -hmm. The future is unknown. We don't have eyes in the back of our head. So that might be part of it. Are gonna happen, it's it's yeah. also true that in in um, in Mandarin, in some other Asian languages, the direction of time is tends to be vertical, up or down. Is that right, Kevin? <laughs> what do you mean? Up anyone, down? Does, does anyone want to say I'm wrong? I, no, that's true. And um, so I don't. <laughs> so which one's up? Which is down? I don't know. We're don't, falling into the don't, future. Don't cross examine me now. <laughs> uh, but the, the point is that Rising that um, our ideas of of time, our ideas of everything, but mm -hmm. in particular of time, have a lot to do with the language that we speak. And. We get into, we learn certain habits early on in life, mm -hmm. and those habits seem natural to us. So one of the deep cultural events is religion, and what do you make of what the various religions do with time? Well, that's, a, that's another question that I wanted to take seriously in the book, even though I'm not especially religious myself. There are... Good. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, first of all... <laughs> I mean, that gives you some... You know, you're not going to oh, argue one particular... I'm not going to hell? Uh, yeah. Um, it's, not, it's, it's not at all obvious. I mean, I have some religious friends and I cons some theologically sophisticated friends who I consulted on, on questions like, well, is God in effect a sort of time traveler? Is he mm -hmm. alive in the past and the future all at the same time? Is all of time visible mm -hmm. to him or her? So you might be thinking the answer to that is obvious, but I hope that for some of you it's obvious one way and for some of you it's obvious the other way because you can argue it both ways. Um, certainly if you think God is omnipotent and omniscient, that ought to include knowledge of the future. No surprises but, there. Right. But when you think about the stories we tell about God 
he tends to be an interventionist. He mm -hmm. tends to care what we do. He tends to plan or at least think. Is it possible to think and be conscious mm -hmm. if all time already exists for you? So isn't it, isn't it just as, as plausible to say that God lives in time with the rest of us? Mm -hmm. There's some traditions, there's some Hindu stuff, there's a beautiful book called The King and the Corpse by a guy named Zimmer that got me years ago. And uh, there's all these gods, and they're uh, sort of in the timeless space of the gods occupy. And uh, they are desperately interested in what these seemingly trivial humans are up to because they live in time and they discover stuff, and the gods don't get to do that. And so they're really, really interested and in intervene sometimes in what humans are up to because it's the only way that they can basically engage change. They engage progress, they can engage tragedy, they can engage the <laughs> things that, that time does. And that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> Looking for another question. Uh, <laughs> Jonas Bashir asks, isn't the notion that my life will be different from my forebearers uh, just another name for modern, and is science fiction related to that so-called first draft of the future? There's a lot of reference in <coughs> Silicon Valley and elsewhere of sort of tracking on science fiction as a source for good ideas. Uh, let's have a tricorder you know, <laughs> kind of thing. Um, you know, where's our goddamn flying cars? And there's people, you know, working seriously on that. Uh, is that a role that science fiction and these time travel things have? Is to sort of propose where we might go with this malleable future? Definitely, and <coughs> and complicatedly, and works both ways. And a lot of the this was also. Part of the fun for me of this project was watching different cultural threads play themselves out. My book is partly set in a narrow arena of writing about sci-fi, but mm. it's also set in the arena of literature and mm. um, also science, which has developed and changed its views of time drastically over the century, and also in philosophy, which got blindsided by science. You know, philosophy was, <laughs> philosophy and I'll include in that the beginnings of psychology, because I'm thinking about William James and Henri Bergson, mm -hmm. um, who were very devotedly th trying to explore ideas of time. Mm -hmm. um, and in, and in interesting ways, when Einstein came along and, and essentially wiped them out in the, you know, in the sweepstakes of public opinion. Um, maybe I should explain what I mean by that. Yeah, how does astrophysical what, time what I, what play I mean by into that is, psychological time except it's just another story? I, I'll, I'll say, if you believe it's just another story, then you have not been persuaded, let's say, by... Mm -hmm by the scientific consensus, by Einstein. And, and I'd argue that in the general court of public opinion, mm -hmm. people tend to think, well, the physicists have, they have s some special knowledge. Mm -hmm. They have a special claim. And by the way, I believe this too. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not making fun of this idea. Um, they have a special claim to um, a type of knowledge that is not merely subjective. Right. And you can say that while recognizing fully how subjective every individual scientist is mm -hmm. as a human being. And I'm still, I'm still answering your original question because, because yes, physicists read science fiction too and they're, and they're living in the same culture as the rest of us. And um, there's some wonderful examples in, besides Einstein reading or not reading Wells, mm -hmm. There are places where, for example, um, everybody, probably everybody here is familiar with this idea that is more or less alive in the orthodoxy of quantum theory these days, 
of multiple universes. Mm -hmm. The idea that um, that it's legitimate as a as an interpretation of, of quantum mechanics to say that every quantum event is a forking of the universe, uh, a bifurcation mm -hmm. into into multiple universes, um, which you're you may or may not take seriously, but some physicists do, so we'll accept that as at least on the table. In the history of the culture, you can see where that idea first appears, and it first appears in, uh, in the beautiful early story of Jorge Luis Borges, mm. The Garden of Forking Paths, right. in which he expresses in the most perfect language, except with no math, mm -hmm. The, this very idea, and this was this was at least ten years before Hugh Everett, a graduate student in physics, per, first put forward the idea as a serious bit of science. So, again, you want to ask, did Hugh Everett read Borges? It's actually not impossible mm -hmm. that he did, because Borges was was. Uh, um, I bet not too many people know what the first the first literary journal in English was to publish Borges. It was Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine. No way. <laughs> this is true. Um, they printed The Garden of Forking Paths in, in, in English wow. translation wow. because it was sort of, a, sort of a crime story apart from everything else. Anyway, um, where are we going with this? Yes, <laughs> physicists are influenced by science fiction, and that's not a bad thing, because mm -hmm. science fiction is a, is a way we have of working out ideas of, um, as, as the rest of literature is, mm -hmm. a, a way of exploring things that, are, that we need uh, a whole uh, toolbox full of different tools to explore. I just happen to have an artifact here of forking universes. I won't strip completely. But this T-shirt is the T-shirt from the third Star Wars movie, which everybody knows was called The Revenge of the Jedi. For a while. <laughs> and then the universe forked, and they thought that was too bloody, and so they changed it to The Return of the Jedi. But this T-shirt, you know, there you go. So made it over here from this other universe that quantum off. <laughs> because you have special portals. It is special portals. Right. Uh, <clears throat> oh, here okay, comes, you're a science historian. You, pay, you know, you've done, uh, you did this great book on chaos and so on. You pay close attention to this stuff. Do you buy the forking universes? No, personally? no, I don't. Say why. Oh, um, first of all, I should say I am not, I'm not an authority, I'm not a scientist. And, and I do have a kind of um, willingness to trust scientists as generally authoritative, uh -huh. up to a point. But, um, but we're also, uh, we're entitled to use judgment, we're entitled to um, use common sense and, and use the scientist's own methodology. And one, one bit of, of science that I think is, even though it's not official, is actually really useful is Occam's razor. Mm -hmm. Don't look for complicated explanations when simpler ones will do. Don't, don't multiply entities <laughs> unnecessarily. <laughs> well, what is the most extreme example of multiplying entities unnecessarily mm -hmm. than claiming that every time a particle splits, the entire universe splits? and the cat is dead in one universe and alive in the other universe. Uh, also because I looked at the and history... And yet you buy quantum, which is just as difficult. Well, you know? I don't... Uh, it's not that I buy it. I don't feel I have the luxury of buying it or not buying it. I mean, mm -hmm. I accept it as a, as a model that works. Mm -hmm. I, I should say, um, kind of as a general statement of the spirit of science, that that for, I feel strongly that the, the correct that there is a correct spirit of science mm -hmm. and an incorrect spirit of science. I'm about to completely contradict wow. myself, by the way. I'm, and I'm going to say that the incorrect spirit of science is to say that we're going to find out everything. Mm -hmm. We're going to answer all the questions. We're going to get to the truth, and that the and the, the purpose of science is to reach 
the final truth about things. Mm -hmm. There are other scientists who have a much more modest view of the endeavor, mm -hmm. who are just as serious and just as rigorous, I should say, just as mathematical, um, just as reliant on experiment, mm -hmm. just as devoted to the truth, who believe that the purpose of science is to continue asking questions and to maybe get closer and closer to a workable view of reality, but not to find a final reality because there may be no such thing as a final reality, at least that's accessible to us so, or humans. In it, as you said about this book, Time Travel, and sort of building on your own uh, delight with what Heinlein was doing back when with Bob's busy day. Um, and a, your kind of book is, is an inquiry. You go in seeing possibilities, things are kind of starting to cohere and coalesce and gel and make sense, and they lead you on. There's some curiosities that are drawing you into it. So you have different ideas at the beginning of a pro at the end of a process like that than you had at the beginning. Can you say a little bit about how time travel changed for you or time changed for you during the progress of your research and writing? Did you come out in a different place than you started? Yeah, I'll say I'll say two things. I'll say one sort of trivial thing, and you're going you're going to think this is ridiculous, but but I did. I, I had an, an idea when I started the book that maybe time travel as a genre was coming to an end. Ah. That maybe everything had been explored that mm -hmm. could possibly be explored. I mean, when you think about it, every, everybody w tries to one-up the writer who came before. And if, um, you know, if Heinlein is, first he has Bob meeting himself five times, then f a few years later he writes a, a a, a transgender time travel story where uh, the time traveler is his and her father and mother. Mm -hmm. This this book you may know is All You Zombies. Anyway, I thought, okay, everything has been done. <laughs> well, as, as I said earlier, everything hadn't been done and people mm -hmm. kept surprising me and coming up with new things. So that was good. Mm -hmm. But the other thing I want to say is... Um, I did have a kind of, I came to a sort of realization about, no, I don't want to say how we should live, because I don't do that, I, I mean I hate that kind of book, but, but I, I realized that a thing that I had always thought was a, a good piece of wisdom, live in the now, uh -huh. people tell us, um, enjoy the present. Don't waste your brain cells agonizing over lost opportunities hmm. or worrying about what the future will bring because you have no control over that. You know, just enjoy the totality of the sensory experience that is coming to you at this instant. Well, I, I suddenly realized as I was working on this book that that's terrible advice. <laughs> <laughs> that... That... Up, a potted plant lives in the now. <laughs> that um, you use the long now as a metaphor, right. but that's different. Your idea of the long now and in, embraces the past and the future and asks us to think about the stretch, the whole stretch of time. And and that's what uh, that's what I think time travel is good for. That's what, as I said at the end, this is, this is what, what makes us human, is the ability to mm -hmm. live in the past, to live in the future at the same time, to embrace, these, to embrace the contradictions. You make the point in the book, as I recall, that we use stories about the past and stories about the future as ways to sort of engage. The stories about the past are a way to, to sort of rethink what actually happened. It's a way to change the past in ways to tell a different story. Yeah. And the story about the future scenarios or whatever, you can't really affect the future knowledgeably, but you can posit a story in which you can see ways where you might influence things in the direction that looks more favorable than unfavorable. 
Yeah. And so we use these stories that way. And yes, definitely. Some, some, several wise science fiction writers have pointed out that, that they're never writing about the future. They're always writing about the present mm -hmm. because that's what they've got. And they're using the future, the idea of the future, as a way to ask questions about the present, to, to explore um, sometimes the dark underbelly of, of what we're experiencing to, uh, to, to give us, to make, to issue warnings about the direction that we may be heading. Time travel will give us perspective. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.